Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O Culture Podcast, where artists are magicians, where the only fixed state is transition, and where the only boundaries that exist don't actually exist at all. I am Ryan Peverly, your psycho pop for the next few minutes, or millennia, whichever you prefer. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for being here. Our house guest this time around is Kevin McLaughlin, broadcaster, creative media practitioner, and senior lecturer in media production at the University of Northampton over in the UK. Kevin has research interests around the role of spirituality and occultism in contemporary visual culture, and he's here to talk about his forthcoming book and conference, both titled Trans States. No, that phrase does not refer to any sort of identity politics, but it does refer to a sort of radical political notion that the magician, mystic, and artist all converge at one point, the proverbial crossroads, the intersection of the liminal and the numinous, and it is only at this intersection where we can truly revolt and bring down all those corrupt and out-of-date systems that only serve the few and not the many. This is hands down one of my favorite chats that I've recorded for this podcast, In the first few minutes here, you will find out why. They are extremely personal, which is why I enjoyed it so much. Kevin and I dug deep within our capital S selves to erase all borders and boundaries between him and I, and between you and us, and between you and me. Art, magic, alchemy, creativity, liminal space, and what it truly means to have a human experience. Kevin McLaughlin is in the house to talk about all that, your house, right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Kevin McLaughlin, welcome to the show, man. Really appreciate your time. Looking forward to the chat. Yeah, thanks very much. It's uh, it's great to be here, especially since so many of my good friends and colleagues have appeared on your excellent podcast. I'm very excited to be on it, too. Oh, that is very kind of you, man. And yeah, we have, or I have chatted quite a bit with people who you're familiar with, who you've worked with professionally uh, in your research studies and so forth. And some of their names may pop up throughout the conversation here. So, uh, But before we get to any of that, let's start with you. You know, Kevin, you are a a senior lecturer in media production at the University of Northampton. Uh, You call yourself a creative media practitioner. You have research interests around the role of spirituality and occultism in contemporary visual culture. Quite a mouthful, really interesting angle into both your professional work and I guess maybe your academic work too, which overlap obviously. But tell us a bit about, you know, when and where these interests and disciplines began to develop for you. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I think it's even developed a little since then. I mean, the first Trans States conference was focused primarily on sort of visual or culture. And I think that's because I'm primarily a visual artist. And I hadn't really sort of understood what I was doing more broadly in terms of of writing as I do now. And actually, the first Trans States conference made me realize that limiting things to to visual was a was an unnecessary and arbitrary sort of delineation. So, um, so I, I actually consider my field of research more broadly now. In terms of how and where I got into it, well, I mean, do, do you mean esotericism more broadly, or how it became like a field of study for me with regards to my academic career? Uh, all of the above. All of the above. Okay. Well, I mean, I was raised. I'm Irish, so I was raised Irish. Catholic. So I'm not one of these people who was reading occult books from sort of teenage years and sort of fascinated by these things. I was uh, quite the opposite. I was absolutely terrified by these things, you know, because that was the culture that I was brought up in. And I was I was taught to be terrified of these things. So I was a late bloomer in terms of my sort of personal interest in esotericism. And it's actually, well, to me, it's quite interesting, because it says a lot about the manner in which I'm interested in these things 
So it really came to me when I was at university in my teenage years and sort of early 20s. And so I was hugely depressed a lot of the time, which is not a strange story for someone of that age, of course. And when I got to university, I I mean, it was pretty severe. It would be bed bound for days and weeks sometimes. So I, I was quite affected by clinical depression for a number of reasons. And I tried all of the obvious things like antidepressants and and talking therapies. And I didn't find any of those particularly useful. And I became increasingly aware that I needed to find some sort of sort of technology or practice that was going to kind of help me deal with this pathology. And I also became increasingly aware as I sort of became dissociated from myself and watched myself, how much of a burden I was to the people in my life that cared about me, particularly because of the sort of language that I was using about myself. I was like, hugely negative in the way that I talked about myself and described myself. And and I was constantly sort of re-narrativizing this very, very uh, problematic and negative kind of view of my self and my identity based on like my own skewed concept of myself. And even though that's what I believed in my heart, it was really bothering the people that cared about me. And I could see how it was a self-fulfilling prophecy because I was damaging the relationships that I had. And so I, I started this experiment of well, maybe I should just change the language that I use and the words that I use. And so I started telling a new story about myself and I started watching myself and only speaking about myself in sort of positive terms, initially sort of like uh, ironically and playfully about how great I was and how amazing I was and and all of these things. Um, But it went from being like a joke and an ironic thing to becoming more and more normalized. and, And I noticed it actually changed the quality of the relationships that I had with people around me. And over the course of about two years of experimenting with this, um, it completely transformed like my personality, my relationships, my life, and it, it changed my relationship with depression. And I was kind of blown away by how sort of the way we choose to express ourselves, the impact that that can have in our lives and, and in the world around us. And in sort of looking at, at, at this, I kind of came across looking for other examples of of this kind of thing. I came across... Um, Robert Anton Wilson, and I read The Cosmic Trigger, which was the uh, the book that um, pulled the cosmic trigger for me and sort of exploded me off down this sort of esoteric rabbit hole. So I was looking for a whole bunch of technologies, whether through different religious practices or uh, psychotherapies or esoteric practices, you know, that, that might help or that were in some way connected with this sort of uh, initial thing that I discovered about sort of the power of language and sort of um, expressing yourself in sort of radically new ways and sort of transforming your own understanding of the world and therefore transforming the world in essence to you. And so, yeah, it was through Robert Anton Wilson that I sort of read about other esoteric thinkers and and it really snowballed from there. But I, I still think of it in those terms more in terms of a sort of approach of a, a philosophy and a technology. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, well, you mentioned a couple of things in there that really resonated with me personally because of my own battles and struggles that, you know, I think I think a lot of us have that in common. And to be honest, I've, man, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here on the on the show, but I know that a lot of people that I've chatted with, myself included, have come to the occult or this esoteric spirituality after a bout of depression or during it or some other traumatic experience that's got you really down. And when you're really kind of, you know, searching externally for answers, I don't know how a lot of people have stumbled across this stuff, but it just seems like a a common theme, more common than I would have ever thought, to be honest, but a common theme and how people discover this path and this belief system and these practices and that's exactly how I got into this stuff to begin with was, you know, and this was just recent for me, Kevin, you know, like within the past mm. five years ish of my life. I mean, it's not been like a lifelong pursuit for me. It's been, you know, I went through a, a traumatic personal experience, you know, the end of a long term romantic relationship. And I, I found myself just really, you know, sort of lost and searching yeah. for answers both within myself and externally as well. And I realized that I was probably depressed. I was never diagnosed with anything. I've never been to a a psychiatrist or anything like that. But 
I was definitely dealing with some sort of depression. And then I realized, like, man, I think I've always been dealing with some sort of depression since my teenage years on some level. And it just maybe has gotten progressively worse because I had the same patterns that you did where you you think about yourself negatively, you talk about yourself negatively. And then in these moments where, like, you try to be more positive, you know, it almost comes off like conceited on some level. Or at least it felt that way to me. Like when I would try to think of myself or talk about myself in a positive way, maybe it was the way I was thinking or talking, but it always came off to me like, oh, I'm pretty arrogant here, like thinking this of myself. So then I would, I'd like overcorrect and then go back to like the pessimistic view of, of me. And it just like, it just sunk me further down into that hole of despair or whatever I was in. And then it definitely affected my interpersonal relationships to the point where Man, I lost a lot of people who I was close to, and I lost myself too. You know, that relationship with me was just almost non existent. And it was sort of like reflected, you know, outwardly with my relationships with other people as well. So, you know, what you're saying there is I don't know, you're catching me at a, at a weird time here, you know, just in terms of I've been reflecting a lot recently on, you know, who I am and, and what my path forward is. And, you know, I've decided to to end this show after a while. I've done I've been doing this for three years now, and I'm just I'm to the point where I feel like I've outgrown certain things. I've outgrown certain relationships, and mm. it's just time for me to to figure this out for real. You know, and I know that 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 what I've gotten from like this project, what I've gotten from you know these conversations and this material that I've talked about with people, has been very you know self empowering, and it's given me a a better view of who I am and. It's helped contextualize, you know, like kind of what I've been through and it helps shine some light on like where I can improve, for example, and, and how I can improve. And but also like the big picture thing of like how I got here to begin with, you know, like it, it's just very it's very interesting how my life has mirrored like an alchemical process. You know what I mean? I think yeah. all of our lives do on some level, right? Like, yeah, I've spent all those years kind of like in the in the grado of life, you know, that that blackness, that darkness. And now I'm like ready to sort of transmute that into a better version of myself. And but now it's like trying to figure out how exactly to do that. So I'm rambling here. This is probably the longest I've talked <laughs> on this podcast consecutively with a guest. So I apologize. But no, no, I just, win. But, I win the longest and most heartfelt interjection yet. So I'm I'm happy about that. Yeah, I mean, you brought up a lot of <laughs> A lot of interesting and important things yourself there. And I don't think it's any accident that there's a correlation to like the alchemical process at all by any stretch of the imagination. And and it's not it's not just like enormously transformative like ordeals that often bring people to this material. Then often when further investigating and examining the esoteric and and, and sort of occultural ideas ordeals present themselves along the path. You know, it's that uh, wisdom through suffering sort of thing and and it's interesting because the the conference which i know we're going to go on to talk about it at some point this next conference is being themed around the tower and everything you were talking about there sort of reminds me of the tower about this sort of destructive tearing down of you know the security and and notions of of the self and structure and stability and how it seems like the worst or one of the worst cards in the tarot deck, but it also relates to like revelation. And and the thing that comes directly after that is the sort of renewed hope. And and that sometimes um, what seems like a horrific process as we sort of step into the alchemical fires is exactly what's required to tear down the uh, systems and uh, antiquated and corrupted kind of structures that no longer serve us and allow the sort of new things that sort of we need going forward to come through. And it's often a very uncomfortable process. So um, it's certainly not for for everyone. And <laughs> I've caught myself in a few <laughs> situations going, yeah. why do I do this again? Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, it's the only game in town if what you really care about is self-transformation, you know, improving yourself for the better and sort of by proxy improving the world around you for the better and maybe I'm sort of deeply naive but those are things that I really care about um, so one can either sort of be nihilistic or you know one can sort of tr- try to rewrite themselves in the world in 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 new and valuable ways which which serve everybody better you know and create the alchemical gold that you were sort of referring to so 
Yeah, and I think I think a lot of what that process has done for me is it's really shined that light on things like vices and addictions and just yeah. self-limiting behaviors, I guess. And it's things that I never knew were, or I guess things I would never have previously classified as vices or addictions or self-limiting behaviors, but it was like something like just transformed in my brain or my psyche or something, my spirit. And it Mm. just showed me that, you know, a lot of the things that you've normalized in your life are actually the things that are holding you back. And that's a tough pill to swallow. It's an even tougher thing to like acknowledge, but it's even tougher to like counteract or reverse, I guess, you know what I'm trying to say? But being aware of it is a really important first stage, you know, being w- watching yourself and the cycles that you go through and the behaviors that you return to. And, you know, the first stage is being aware of them. And I'd also add to that that there's an inverse of that. There's not just an awareness of like things that you didn't previously notice were vices and don't serve you. There's also a tendency for people to kind of shadow project things about themselves which they that they really despise and sort of uh, not even be entirely aware of that in all cases like bury that and want to transform themselves from a position of these are all the things about myself that I hate and don't want to be I read a thing not that long ago which 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 really hit me quite hard which was that you know you cannot hate yourself into a version of yourself that you love and Mm -hmm. And I think that's important too. So for me, a lot of the shadow work is about sort of integrating those things which may appear to be vices or appear to be problematic, but are actually an important part of your your whole life self. So it's both those things. It's it's noticing problematic behaviors and cycles. And as I say, attention on them and being aware of them is the first step because that allows one to maybe later do something about it, flip the script or reprogram it in some way. But also being aware of sort of unconscious negative feelings towards aspects of the self that that actually have value, you know, that you may not initially be aware of the value that they have. That for me has been a big part of the process as well. So embracing things which I primarily thought were problematic or vices and understanding the ways in which they serve me. Yeah, I've done a lot of the, uh, unfortunately, I've done a lot of the, the psychological projection of my shadow onto other people. And I can think of one person in general who I know listens to every episode and she's my biggest supporter here. And I've done a lot of that to her and I apologize to her many times privately for it. But, you know, she probably needs to know publicly that I apologize for that sort of behavior because it it really is. It sucks when you know that you've treated people like that and you don't know how much damage it really causes until it's almost too late. And, uh, you know, that's just, uh, that's again, just a, a really hard truth to come to in your journey here. And, but the other thing you said too, you know, about, kind of the flip side of learning maybe what you're also good at along the way too, like at the same time, you know, like I've, Mm. I can't tell you like how many things like talents or skills that I've discovered about myself while also trying to address those negative things, you know, those self-limiting things, like finding out what I'm passionate about and what I'm good at and where I can succeed or where I do succeed in my own life here. And that's been the flip side to that. It's that's the positive progress that you know, you make along the way too. Sometimes it gets overshadowed, uh, pun intended, you know, by all the, the sure. <laughs> by all the uh, negative stuff. But at the same time, it's like, you know, you got to go through that, that negative stuff to find out what that positive stuff is too. And gosh, it's, it's unfolding at the same time, which is very tough to deal with some days, you know, but you know, I guess it is what it is. We all go through it. So, you know, and I'm, gosh, I feel like I'm making this whole conversation about me, but uh, let's get back. No, to... I mean, that's not inappropriate. I mean, it's certainly not about you. It's just because we're talking about self and self-development and self-realization. So of course you're relating it to your own self. That's totally normal. But sorry, okay. where did you want to get back to? Well, I just, I guess I wanted to try to you know, get back to the conference. You also have a book coming out soon. And I'd love to talk about both. And I guess we should start with the concept of both uh, because the book and the conference overlap. Uh, They both go under the name Trans States, which you mentioned earlier. That's T-R-A-N-S dash space S-T-A-T-E-S. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about what that phrase means. And to be honest, you know, I'm a I'm an English guy. I'm like a grammar, you know, spelling title person 
So I, I want to know what that phrase means to you, like how you define it. Yeah. And I also want to know why there's that curious space in the middle of the name. That's really intriguing to me. Yeah. First of all, thanks for noticing the space because not everybody does. And it's, it's very clearly there. I guess, okay, first of all, trans states is obviously a pun on trans states. And I quite like, you know, working with wordplay and playing with language and puns. Gods of magic are often gods of communication and language and trickster gods and all of that seemed entirely appropriate. But more than that, inherent in this phrase, I wanted it to be, uh, I've mentioned sort of elsewhere, um, a coincidence a positorium. So I wanted it to be a unity of opposites. I wanted to provide, uh, present sort of what seems to be two oppositional ideas that are in fact interconnected. So with the trans, of course, you have the, the, the meaning of beyond through, you know, on the other side, it has all of these like movement and active and volatile kind of traits. And with state, you have the exact opposite. A state is a conditioner, a way of being that exists at a particular time. And so kind of together, it has this kind of paradoxical quality of, of, of containing in terms of, uh, you know, alchemically, both the fixed and the, uh, and the volatile of somehow movement, but also stasis. And yet it kind of makes perfect sense as, a, as an expression, even though it seems to have this um, internal kind of juxtaposition. And actually, this is something I got initially from Terence McKenna, who I was influenced a lot by in my younger years not necessarily as a, as, as a thinker because he was often pretty off the cuff and could be like loose with his facts, as, as people know. But um, his bardic quality, I mean, he, he really was a magician in, in many ways and his use of language is definitely entrancing. And I've listened to hundreds and hundreds of hours of his talks and he talks specifically about this because he was heavily influenced by, um, by alchemy. And he talks about the Coincidentia Positorium. In fact, he actually employed it in some of his own titles, some of his earlier titles like True Hallucinations or Invisible Landscape. You see that in Invisible Landscape, you see that tension between the seen and unseen or True Hallucinations is purposefully playing on taking you in two different directions. And so honestly, I wanted to come up with something that uh, was going to be impactful and communicate a huge amount of ideas in a really short, short two word phrase. And I use this concept as a way to, to come up with the initial phrase. And I guess the space is there to really hammer home this point that what we have is, although it's a underlying unified singularity, It is two kind of, or can be understood as two kind of separate concepts. So I want people to think about the trans and the state aspect of it as a binary, because so much of my work and so much of what I do is about looking at the binaries that we sort of project onto the world and assume and kind of deconstruct those binaries and see how a lot of the times what we're dealing with is these... uh, as a unified coincidence of, of, of opposites. You know, it's, it's like an idiom. We have it built into our language. We talk about two sides of the same coin. So we, we, we have a deep understanding of this, how two perceived opposites can, in fact, transpose each other or in many ways be the same as each other. But we don't always employ it as effectively in our everyday understanding of the world as we could. So I just wanted to make this important concept sort of front and center because the first conference was about boundary crossing and so right in the title there um, I had the the sort of description of boundary crossing within the actual uh, the wording and uh, the concept that I was employing. Yeah when I first saw the the name in print of the conference or I guess in print on the web if you want to call that in print these days but I thought man is this a typo you know like is that space meant to be there and then as I comb through more material I was like okay so this is intentional which I really love that I love it I loved like just sort of the 
you know, sort of the low key kind of playful thematic nature of it. And but the first thing I thought of when I really sort of like let it register in me that it was intentional was that concept of the space between or the concept of yes. like the concept of like liminal space even, which kind of ties back to what we were talking about earlier where I think maybe I think of liminal space differently than we talk about it these days. But I think of it as sort of like that uncomfortable space where you do feel like a little bit different or a little bit off, not yourself. You know, like you're sort of like in that in-between space of maybe even light and dark if we want to go back to the alchemical theme there. So I don't know if you thought about all that, but what do you make of that interpretation of just that space in the title of these things? Yeah, I mean, the for, for me, yeah, the, the space exists sort of conceptually between because we've got two different concepts, we've kind of got two categories. And by having two categories, we've created this boundary is it this thing or is it that thing which is precisely what you're talking about and that that sort of that's what creates the liminal space and of course liminality is is absolutely key and 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 core to sort of everything that we're doing with the conference and and with my own work but to 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 magic more broadly you know like it's it's in the the liminality and the spaces in between where the where the magic really happens you know both literally and figuratively so i mean that's absolutely not accidental no and and that space was created it was actively created you know by an authored intention which is also what goes on with magic if one translates that liminal space to the concept of the magic circle which numerous thinkers have that's another kind of authored liminal space which has been sort of created with the intent and will of the magician and it creates a, a space outside of the norm in which you can sort of allow the uh, the radically different to come through which is very much uh, at the heart of kind of magical processes i think and artistic processes which obviously many people including myself sort of see them as one and the same i know you are sympathetic to that view yourself so was crowley and and, and so is Alan Moore, of course, who've specifically made that correlation. Uh, and I think, you know, art properly understood and revelation and magic, they, they, all have, um, they all have these kind of similar idea of something outside of the world as it is sort of bleeding through, um, whether that's revelation, whether it's sort of new understanding, whether it's like uh, new possibilities or future production whether it's the creative process by some kind of unconscious creativity, like some Jungian understanding of some unconscious creative process outside of the self, creating these liminal spaces which allow the novel and the numinous to like bleed into the world. It seems to be at the heart of, of most of those kind of uh, ways of interacting with the world. And, and that's something that I'm really fascinated by as well. I'm, f- I'm fascinated by the um, the links between things, the similarities between things, unlike a lot of academics who are hyper specialists, it's obviously an important part of academia. I'm I'm a generalist to the extreme. The conference is a transdisciplinary conference, so it goes a, a further step than being interdisciplinary to trying to sort of look at concepts and ideas which are beyond and emergent from sort of the interplay between sort of different modes of thinking and thought. So, I mean, for me personally, I'm sort of very interested in how these are technologies of being in the world and how that relates to the self and how it relates to one's wider culture. And I'm sort of looking at that uh, through all of the different lenses that I have available to me. And so this conference was special it was experimental in being transdisciplinary and it was particular in purposefully bringing together a, a meeting of different peoples. I called it a, a convocation, a meeting of different peoples that actually already have a discourse between them. But when one goes to conferences, often one goes to more practitioner based, more popularized conferences, which are much more full of maybe believers and everyday practitioners of magic. And then there are other conferences which are more dry and academic and maybe try and approach the subject from this idea of being, uh, you know, the objective scholar 
who can sort of look at the subject from a distance and not be embroiled within it. And I wanted to create a space where we could purposefully cross those perceived boundaries between the academy, between the incredible independent scholars that we have in the esoteric world. And a lot of them are really capable independent scholars and have an important voice uh, and, and a lot of important things to say in the subject area. And magical practitioners and artists that are interested in art produced through changes in their consciousness, but might not immediately consider themselves as being sort of esoteric artists or magically inclined. So I was interested in all the different alterations of consciousness, different forms of how psychedelics relate to this experience, how shamanic approaches or, you know, other approaches which are really focused on purposefully shifting one's consciousness and or in the creation of one's art and and yeah and then just seeing what putting all those people together in a room and allowing them the opportunity to approach the subject in a less stunted and structured way maybe and making it a bit more playful you know which is an important ingredient and just seeing what arose from that and what arose from that was it was a hugely successful conference, which immediately had people calling out for the, the second installment. The last conference was in 2016, and I would have liked to have come back after a couple of years because I pretty much do it single-handedly, so it's a huge, um, it's a huge undertaking. Um, but we're finally back three years later. Who knows, maybe I'll, maybe I'll keep repeating them at three-year intervals. Three is a significant number in many of these um, esoteric lines of thought and religious lines of thought, so, so maybe it should be that way. But it was also an idea of its time, and, and I take that on board as well. Um, it was definitely something, you know, and we just as I was talking about before, I talk about this in my class with my students, you know, this sense of creating certain forms of art and feeling like and writing of various kinds and feeling like the work comes through you instead of from you about moving yourself out of the way and, and some form of like inspiration sort of taking over. I think a little bit of that happened with regards to the conference, you know, it had a whole energy of its own and, and, and I was really sort of running, chasing after it in many respects. So I, I consider myself very fortunate to have been um, in the right place at the right time when this idea came around. Yeah, you mentioned the first conference was in 2016. The book is coming out soon, and it's kind of based on or inspired by material from the presentations from that first conference, and uh, many different voices in there, some of which people should be familiar with, obviously. The book does feature a foreword by Alan Moore, who you mentioned earlier. He's a obviously world-renowned artist and magician, and yes, those are the same things, as, as we know by now, but, you know, I really, I really liked what Alan wrote here, actually, in his forward, and... Oh, it's a great forward. It, it really is, is. Yeah. and for people who haven't read it, not many people have read it, because the book's not out yet, but I'd love it if you could maybe just summarize, like, you know, since Alan's not here to speak for himself, maybe just summarize, like, that forward, his thoughts here for us, because they do relate to these transitional states, this liminal space that we're talking about, but I thought he had a really sort of unique angle into it. Yeah, okay. I'll do my best to do that. I mean, first of all, so I'm at the University of Northampton. So Northampton's famous for only two things, really, and that is shoes and Alan Moore. And being sort of a practicing magician myself and wanting to put on an international conference on uh, art culture, contemporary art culture, uh, I obviously knew I wanted Alan to be there. And the reason Alan wrote the forward is because he was one of the keynotes for the original conference in 2016. And that was part of my purposeful. I wanted to have, of course, leading scholars in the field of the study of esotericism. But I also wanted to have a practitioner artist there as well, sort of speaking for the practitioner artist amongst the keynotes themselves. But I mean, it took me a long time to, to get to meet Alan. It took me about two years to get in touch with him and meet up with him. And, and, and we finally did. And he was incredibly kind to um, agree to do this and, and, and to also subsequently write the forward to which you're talking about. And yeah, I mean, the forward, I mean, obviously he's written it <laughs> at length for a reason. And it's, as you've read it yourself, it's actually a beautiful piece of writing that takes you on a journey. But essentially he's talking about a, 
um, a concept that he'd sort of raised earlier in his work was that the human race is approaching a phenomenon known as a phase transition period that essentially he gives the example of a phase transition in another situation which is that of boiling water that of if you take water and you know it's a substance in one state and you increase the energy uh, once it passes through the, the the boiling point it goes through a phase transition and and comes out as a steam and steam water vapor and and he's using that as allegorical to to what's going on at the minute and and I think he has an awareness because I think this idea came up originally around the millennium and he has an awareness that there there may be a tendency towards like a a millenarianism here and that you know we're always feeling like we're on the age of some important transitional period but he uh I mean he he does reflect on that and that this is something that's happening cyclically all of the time and at different sort of levels amongst our, our, ourselves as individuals and culture. But he makes the point that, that this is not the, whatever this current moment is, it's not the innocent and carefree morning of our setting forth. So we're definitely, if we look at what's happening with the Anthropocene, if we look at what's happening culturally, if we look at what's happening with the ecological crisis, it's not just millenarianism to know that that we really have reached a stage where you know it seems undeniable that some kind of crisis event seems to be imminent or at least it seems like it's going to take some sort of crisis event to have the kind of enormous transformation that we need to actually survive as a species going forward because there's there's you know there's every chance that um we're one of nature's experiments and we've you know run our course and if we do too much damage i'm quite sure that um the earth won't bat an eyelid in killing us off and so and i because I, I hate i hate that but people frame talk about saving the planet when you know we really that, that that's true to some extent but you know what we ought to be concerned with is the extent to which we're saving our own skin i know it's gotten to the stage that the impact that we're having on the earth is so horrendous that there are many people out there who would suggest that we ought not to be saving ourselves uh, and actually you know the extension of the human species is the is the only way forward i try and be a little bit more hopeful than that although i'm deeply aware that i'm making that feeling that from the position of being human but i still hold on to this idea that you know we might pull something out of the bag at the 11th hour and that some evolutionary shift or or some kind of new technology of being might be something that will actually assist us uh, dealing with this phase transition event that's the same thing that alan's speaking to as well and i think that he sees he sees uh, magic um, similarly in that way, as partly as a, as, as a radically political tool. And that we see human culture appears to be entering some kind of deeply fluid kind of phase that's, that's nebulous and that's ambiguous in ways that we're really struggling with. And a lot of people's a lot of people's reaction is to to run backwards to make calls for bringing back sort of grand narratives and the kind of uh, structural certainty of modernity. Whereas in Alan's amazing forward, he he sees better how we might want to look at magic as a philosophy and a technology to be able to approach this new fluid and ambiguous future in a way where we might be able to traverse this period of, 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 of massive change, this phase transition that we talk about. Yeah. And you said something in there that I agree with in terms of at some point, I, I just feel like mother nature is going to write the ship on us and we're going <laughs> to, we're going to regret that. But I have to ask would be you a fair some... call if she did do that. I think we all have to recognize well, that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> we can only do so much before somebody puts us back in our place. Right. At the same time, though, I like to examine these things from different perspectives, and one of them is the role of the cynic, which I play rather well. And I just want to have to ask you this, based on what you were saying there, in terms of 
you know, always feeling like we're on the verge of something big or the crisis moment or that, that sort of turning point, like, oh, it's coming any day now, right? Is that maybe the hubris of being human? In, in terms of over-assuming the, our, the importance of ourselves? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, without question, and, and this is actually part of the problem and can even be seen as part of the problem within esotericism because we so often, you know, it's the human that has the spark of the divine in them. It's the human who's the center of the mandala. And of course, that's speciest and almost certainly something that we think just because we're human. And it is definitely the case that that this is thematically recurring all of the time and that we get this sense uh, this we have certainly overinflated the importance in previous similar sort of millenarian moments of our life you know remember y2k for example i didn't buy into that but you know people certainly do let this kind of sense of the importance of a kind of monumental change get carried away with it but I just think that some of those things that we've already discussed with regards to what we're doing to the planet, with regards to the ecological crisis that we are definitely in the middle of, with regards to where we are in terms of our financial systems, it seems hard to deny because the the alternative view, which is that business as usual will be absolutely fine seems far too problematic. So maybe it is the case that this is a kind of a, an inflation of our importance, but the Anthropocene doesn't seem to be an inflation of our importance. I mean, there's there's strong data to show the impact that we're having, that we're writing into the geological record of the planet. And if we're rewriting things to the extent that we're rewriting into the geological record of the planet, I think we need to accept that we are rewriting the world in a profound way and that we need to take a bit more responsibility for how we are going about that rewriting. And we may be wrong, but if the response is taking radical responsibility for the way that we're writing culture and the impact that that has into the broader world, then I don't think that is in any way problematic because only good can come of that. And I think it's an assumption that has a valuable pragmatic end. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that 100%, man. And, you know, going back to the book, you wrote a piece for it yourself, obviously, uh, the introduction about the art of crossing over. And I am curious about, you know, the term art there, what you mean by that. Obviously, we've been talking a little bit about crossing over in general, you know, with the boundaries and the liminal space. But I'm curious what you mean by that phrase, the art of crossing over. Obviously, it's a multifaceted term, but, you know, hey, I think we got time. Yeah, I mean, I guess there again, I'm trying to have plural meanings. So I literally mean the art of crossing over as in the art and technology invested in the processes of crossing over, you know, the art and craft of engaging in activities which are boundary crossing in some sense, whether that relates to the culture or whether it relates to consciousness. We're talking about techniques here and processes and modes of being which relate to the the art of crossing over. But then also it's supposed to imply the art you know, which is produced because of and from the act of crossing over. So it relates both to the processes that artists undergo and also the artifacts which they create, that are created from the process of crossing over. So that, that was the sense in which, in which I meant it. Well, is there in your head when you're writing about that or talking through it just now, is there, do you have like destinations in mind whether they're physical or liminal or mental or whatever, like spiritual, do you have, like, where do you think, like, in your own life that that applies? Like, where are you crossing over from and to? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, so many different places. So, you know, there's about me, there's about the crossing over between the personal and the professional. 
which has happened in me sort of coming out of the broom closet, as we say. And like, there's the crossing over in terms of the subverting of the institutional space of the university to bring in this kind of, of material. I mean, I, I would resist against it being a limiting idea because I really want it to be that all-encompassing idea. Uh, and I talk, I talk about gods of boundaries, and often they're gods of magic as well. I talk specifically about Hermes as a god of boundaries and, and, and crossroads and crossing of boundaries and about this idea how in creating boundaries you know, which are often things that we project onto the world that aren't actually there uh, in any kind of um, physical sense. It's often something ideological that we project out onto the world. And they set limits and they help us understand the world, but they also have the, they don't just set limits, they also create a sense of curiosity and exploration which is something that the magician and the artist are, are deeply concerned with. And they also create the sense of here and there. And beyond a given boundary, we have the mysterious otherness. So just by producing a frontier, by defining a frontier, we've, we've created a sense of, of self and a sense of otherness beyond the frontier. And, and those structures, which ourselves and society are made up of, they do restrain us and contain us, but they do serve us as well. They, they're they double-natured too, and they're valuable. But what we have to think about is who who's creating those, those structures, who's deciding where the boundaries lie and why. And one of the points that I make in my introduction is that's something that scholars and artists and magicians that are all concerned with is the defining and redefining of these boundaries and understanding that although boundaries seem fixed, they're actually fluid and they're, they're changing under various pressures of uh, redefinition and, and, and re-narrativizing and counter-narrativizing and all of, all of these things. And when we look at the world and we see it as so fixed and rigid and structured and and people are often like, oh, this is the way it is, and it's just the way it is, and a kind of sense of hopelessness. Obviously, coming from a position of seeing a need for, for, for radical change, and not just radical change, but radical empowerment of the individual to make that change, and very much about the democratization of the powers that are invested in these philosophies and technologies and approaches to life. And so... It's important for me to, to to promote that to other people that they can engage in the process of, of of redefining or reconsidering these boundaries, or at least be aware of the extent to which other people have put structures and cultural programs and stories and narratives and systems of control in, pra- in place that they might not be thinking about, and therefore they're kind of subjected to them. So I'm very interested in people taking authorial control over their own understanding of the meaning and their relationship to the world. And so not being caught up in like again, like Taryn said, if you you know, if you don't have your own plan, you're a part of somebody else's plan. Or I think about uh Douglas Rushkoff, who I know you who's amazing and I know you've spoken to and and his book Programmer Be Programmed. I take this to the kind of programming involved in the recodification of of culture more broadly and of the self. And I I see these processes as when we engage with them, we're actively reprogramming and actively authoring the rewriting our own self into the world and the culture that we're embedded in. And uh, I want people to be actively doing that on as wide a scale as possible, because otherwise we're subject to others' cultural programming who may not have our best interests at heart. So I see this as like a a radically political concern. I don't know if I drifted off there slightly (laughs) because we were talking about boundaries, but I guess the point being that it's important to realize that boundaries, they don't have to be there. Just because we, you know, we need to question why they're there, if they should be there, and recognize, you know, that 
they will be, they will change through certain pressures and wider discourses and, and various other things, and that we should all sort of engage in that process as broadly and as democratically as possible. And that's what, you know, that's what artists do. That's what magicians do. It's no accident that so many artists and magicians are involved in, in radical politics as well. Those, those things are interconnected. It's about approaching the world concerned with transformation, concerned with a uh, radical responsibility to kind of make better yourself in the world and, and, and reimagine it and revisioning it, revisioning it in a way that uh, is beneficial to yourself, of course, but also to, to the others, which are really, once again, the self-other is, is another false binary, really, when all said and done. Absolutely. And you sort of bled well into my next question, but we're going to actually make a transition ourselves here from <laughs> the free audience to some Patreon bonus questions. Before we do that, though, you know, the upcoming conference that you're talking about, Trans States, uh, the subtitle, The Art of Revelation, takes place September 13th and 14th at the University of Northampton. Uh, if people are interested in learning more about the conference or getting tickets, where can they do that? Yeah, they can do that at our website, which is trans, as you've already pointed out, is T-R-A-N-S hyphen states dot org. You'll forgo the space this time because your web browser won't allow it. So it's just trans hyphen states dot org. And that's our main website. And you can find out everything you need to know about the conference there, um, including sort of tickets for the upcoming conference. And of course, the book, which we are pretty sure, hoping uh, will be released uh, to coincide with the new conference. There will be details that's coming out with Fulger Press, and there'll be details with regards to the pre-ordering of the book and its availability. We'll put that on the Trans States website as well. So um, yeah, everything you need to know can be found there. Absolutely. And where can people keep up with you personally if they're interested in following more of your work? Yeah, <laughs> If they so desire, if they Google Cavan McLaughlin, there aren't that many of us. So I, <laughs> I, I'm lucky to have the top few uh, uh, Google hits because I have such an obscure name. But um, uh, they can follow me at Twitter, uh, which is at Cavan McLaughlin, all one word. I'm available on, on Facebook, of course, which is uh, facebook.com forward Cavan M. Um, again, if they just run a search on Facebook for Cavan McLaughlin, They'll figure out which of the two or three of us is me uh, with relative ease, I would suggest. So, um, yeah, available through those places and, and, and through the landing page of my university. But honestly, if you Google my name, uh, I'm easy to find. Absolutely. We'll link uh, all of that in the show notes for people who are interested in learning more about you, the conference, uh, the book, and whatever else I can dig up and throw in there. So thank you very much for the opportunity for me to speak about the conference and the work that I'm doing. And thank you very much for what you're doing with the podcast. It's, it's been a, a great value uh, to my life. So um, I appreciate all the hard work you've put into that yourself. And well, thank you so much, man. That's totally kind of you. And, you know, <laughs> the least I can do is share my own journey with people and hope that it resonates with them and that they take something from, you know, the hours and hours of material that I put out there. I appreciate you engaging with it yourself. And it's a really small world, you know, like, just when you think about it, I never would imagine that I've talked to some of the people I've talked to here and about the things that I've been talking with them about. So I learned something from everybody and I've got so much out of this chat. I just wanted to thank you for that, for especially playing along near the beginning when I got real personal there. So thanks for listening, man. No, no I'm, I'm actually honored that you, that you wanted to, to put that forward. So thank you for doing that. Uh, it's quite special that you felt, um, comfortable and that um it was appropriate for you to to share like that so thanks for doing that no problem man no problem it's the least i can do for you so you know i only got a few episodes left it's these kind of chats you know that really i think mean the most to me you know i can talk to people about books about fucking ufos you know whatever whatever <laughs> but it's this it's this sort of stuff it's the personal transformation stuff you know that really i, I don't know that's going to sit with me for a long time and i appreciate you bringing that that aspect of your work here and sharing it with everybody. And I know that, to be honest, these are the types of chats that resonate the most with the audience too. You know, like there's a million podcasts talking about 
you know, things like UFOs and conspiracies and the occult in general, magic, whatever. But there's not a lot of people out there talking about it from a level like I think we got to. So I really appreciate that. All right. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. And there you have it. My thanks again to Kevin McLaughlin. I'll tell you what, I don't even know what to say after this one. This chat to me while I was having it just felt like a dreamscape. I wasn't lost in it, but I was definitely sort of floating through it. Because that beginning portion really caught me off guard, but I just went with it. And I'm glad I did. That was some real magic right there, you know, two grown-ass men opening up about their battles with depression and a continual quest to not just overcome that, but transmute it into something positive, something beautiful born out of tragedy and hopelessness, something that resembles hopefully on some level a living, breathing piece of art and thus an act of magic, if you will. I mean, there is no greater achievement in this life than the fusion of flesh and spirit and breathing those in together. You really are a walking, talking art installation, and some days you're gonna feel ugly, sad, depressed, frustrated, angry, and it's okay to experience those emotions, to let them pass through you. But understand that they are just passing through. Emotions are temporary. Do not let those negative emotions root in you because that's when they become feelings. And negative feelings are much more difficult to transition away from. Believe me, I've been trying to do that for, well, probably 20 years now. And I understand that my canvas here is a work in progress. It will never be complete until my flesh begins to decay and decompose. And when that happens, I do not want my traumas to bleed into the earth. I do not want to leave behind any memory of misbehavior, be it mental or material. I want to take the pain, and I want to transmute that into pleasure, and I will, and so will you, because that's what we do. We transition from one state to another constantly, endlessly, from peaks to valleys, highs to lows, ups to downs, strikes to gutters, dude. But I'm tired of seeing people who hit 10 pins in one frame and 2 pins the next. I've done that for years. I'd much rather get seven, eight, nine pins every frame. I'm never going to roll a perfect game, but at least I'll be consistent every time out. That's the real art and magic and alchemy you've been reading about, that you've been listening to others talk about all these years. Oh, there is a physical component to it, sure. There's real physical treasure out there for the taking, don't get me wrong. But it's not gold, not money, not jewels, not material, not possessions. It's being able to hold someone close to you and know that you have their back and they have yours. Because you've both been through those alchemical fires, because you've both been destroyed by those fires, but you've also been cleansed, purged of the venom in your voice and the fear in your heart. Time to put down the sword, because you're only stabbing yourself here. And pick up the pen instead, or the brush, or the wand, and rewrite, or redraw, or recast the story of you, because when you do that, you also recast the story of us. And as a magician much more magical than me once said, time to evacuate the venom and the fear that binds you and chase away that deceiver inside yourself. It's been a long time coming. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, another 26 minutes with Kevin where we talked about how art transcends false binaries. Kevin also gave us a sneak peek of his presentation at this year's Trans States conference called Revisionary Mythmaking, the Antidote to Codified Structural Oppression. We also talked a little bit about taking the authorship of your own story back. Great stuff in that extension for sure. And if you're in the UK or around the UK, and you can get to the Trans States Conference September 13th to 14th, I'd highly recommend it. I don't think you will regret it at all. Anyway, my thanks to new patrons William, Kyle, and Steve for their recent contributions to the Patreon campaign. If you're interested in hearing the extension with Kevin or any other extension from past guests, Patreon.com slash culture is the place to do so. And that puts a bow on yet another episode here. My apologies for talking so damn much, but you know, I'm not holding back anymore. This is me. And as this podcast winds down, well, I don't have a lot of fucks left to give. So take what I say or leave what I say. Doesn't matter much to me. But know that I mean every goddamn word of it. Because this is my love language. And I'm not going to let you down. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself. Think for yourself and question authority.
please rewind this cassette.